Allow me to say a few words about what LIRU is before I go into the topic of today. It stands for League of European Research Universities. We are an association of some of the most prominent leading research universities in Europe, 23 currently. We started with 12 in 2010. Two. And uh, our remit is to foster education, research and commitment in society across a broad front in Europe. We do that mostly as a body, as a network, an association that tries to uh, form policy views and advocate those views, defend the role that universities and fundamental frontier research take in Europe, in Brussels, at the EU institutions and beyond. We are 23 members now. I do have to say we are an, an, a sort of closed club. Uh, we've had three expansions now. The membership is by invitation and we do look very carefully at the research performance and impact that our universities have to be able to speak with a distinctive voice of really research intensive universities in Brussels. And our Where do I point this in order to advance? seems to go randomly. Yes, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> this nice little map, just to show you that we are represented in 12 countries, so Belgium, the Netherlands, France, Germany, the UK, Spain, Italy, Finland, Sweden, Switzerland, Denmark, and Ireland. Uh, as you can see, that kind of represents the northwestern uh, corridor of Europe. And uh, that is unfortunate, and we try to work on uh, trying to redress that, that balance, not through membership in the organization, but in other ways. The way we work is uh, really to try and influence and speak up in Brussels uh, what we always say, we want to rock the boat. We want to say things that people will remember and act on and we'd like to lead by example. So we have various kinds of public and private meetings, large meetings, small meetings with all kinds of officials uh, in the European Commission, the European Parliament and also work often via our members with the national authorities, so national ministers for research and innovation and uh, education and so on, to make a national um, way of advocating for universities. We also like to develop best practice between our members and uh, encourage the exchange of learning, of practice, what are your challenges, how are you dealing with this and that, and that leads to institutional reflection, which the universities find very useful, but of course it's also very necessary for us as policymakers active in Brussels. We hope that we actually, uh, even though we are a small group, have relevance for a much larger set of universities in Europe, and we do also uh, have links with other similar networks around the world. So, a little bit about EU policy. On the left there, you see uh, Commissioner Moides, the current Commissioner for Research and Innovation. He is very much focused on his agenda in his current term, which lasts until 2019, which is about open science, open innovation, and open to the world. The previous commissioner had more of a focus on the era, the European research area, which is the goal of uniting Europe as a unified research market. And uh, I mention that because the previous commissioner, who was a woman, Mary Gagan Quinn, had five priorities in that era policy. The third of it was gender issues. We found that very useful, actually, to 
activate and motivate and support the actions that we were doing. Uh, that is not to say that gender is not important for the current commissioner. I, don't, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to go as far as that. He has, on the contrary, said that it is important. Of course, this is also an, uh, has an effect in the funding program of the EU, Horizon 2020, where there are three goals for gender balance in decision making, gender balance in teams, and the uh, gender dimension in research content, as it's called in the EU speak, or as Cara Tannenbaum called it, the gender and sex-based analysis. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. We, as LIRU, we uh, publish a lot of our position views and policies in all kinds of papers, just to give you an idea that it's not just about gender, that is one of our activities. But we are currently very much focused already on the next framework program for research in Europe, which won't start until to 2021, uh, but the uh, negotiations, discussions about what it should look like are already full underway. We, as an example, uh, our position paper on the next framework program is going to be out June 20th with a presentation in Brussels. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to say as a group, as a network, we also try to gender mainstream, if I can put it that way, our activities. So we look very careful in our papers or whether we are addressing uh, gender things. So we have looked at that in our next framework program, the FP9 paper, and we make suggestions to the EU about gender equality. And we do that, for instance, in interdisciplinarity. We have looked at you know, the issue of women in interdisciplinary careers. Um, so I think that's important that we as, an, as a network have become very sensitive to the issue of gender equality in our organizations. Right. Uh, just a number of other topics that we are uh, involved in, but I won't go into those now. And let me get right to the issue of what we have called in a paper we did on this issue, GRI, Gendered Research and Innovation. Uh, like Kara said before, we also think that the European, the EU, EU speak term of the gender dimension in research content doesn't really cover very well. I really liked Kara's uh, an, uh, definition or question, say, look at it as who is being studied or what is being studied. It's not about the representation of women. And that's actually a very important point. We published this paper in 2015. We started working on this issue about in 2013. I was amazed, surprised how much lack of awareness there was about this in the universities, especially at the leadership level with rectors, vice rectors, senior management, you know, vice rectors for research. Um, and and that's, an, that's an issue, and it remains to be an issue for universities to engage with this issue. I often say to them, if you want to know what it's like, give examples. Think in terms of examples. And I like this example because it's a way in which the men are on the focus, right? Often it's about women being uh, on the focus. But did you know that eating disorders is also an issue, a research issue in young men? We know anorexia and so on, we associate it with girls and women, but not with men. And so there was research at the universities of Oxford showing that this is an, a disease which is underknown, underdiagnosed and undertreated for men and calling for attention to change this. So our definition at the bottom about what this is thank you, <laughs> um, is that GRI is about the processes that integrate sex and gender analysis into all phases of research to assure excellence and quality of outcomes. I'll pick up on some of the elements in that definition in a minute. Right. Um, to sketch the broader context, this 
gender equality we talk about in three different domains and we have adopted this way of talking about it from Landa Schiebinger who is a professor at the University of Stanford has been involved in EU actions but also has a very uh, good site on gendered innovations uh, on the Stanford University website if you want to know more about how it is. Uh, it goes into very good detail about the evidence based for some of the issues that we're talking about. And uh, that's also a point that I'd like to get across. There is a lot of evidence and what we do has to be evidence based. So. GRI, if you want, is about the third question, fixing the knowledge. It's not about fixing the numbers of women. It's not about fixing the institutions, all of which have to happen as well. Issues I will talk about briefly are why it matters, that it matters in all kinds of research, that it also matters in society, social sciences and humanities, which play a crucial role, that it needs to be integrated into the different phases of the research process, and what universities can and should do, as well as other actors, so governments, funding agencies, the journals, and so on. And if I have time, I hope so, I will talk, go, go into a little bit about what is happening at the EU level in terms of policies. So why does it matter? Basically because university research and research in general matters. Um, this is a statement from a statement we put out in Hefe in 2013 because, you know, because research drives innovation, it drives the solution to global challenges that we face and it makes it possible for us to understand the changing world that we live in. So if we're going to solve some of those global challenges we need interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, inclusive approaches and and that is why this is also important. And if I can expand on that. Yep. Um, the reasons are it's about the quality of the research. It's about producing excellent research, as good research as we can, about groundbreaking research. It's about the power and the vitality of research. Also, because I've said, if we want to do inclusive research, we have to address this issue, because it has also the potential to eliminate bias in our, in our research, which you have heard from the previous speaker as well. And because it saves lives and money. Uh, Cara also mentioned the uh, study on uh, medications that were not done on women and had to be withdrawn from the market. Also, for instance, the pregnant uh, crash dummies, uh, which used to be only men. Now there are also women, they also have pregnant ones, which is very important to study the effect on the unborn fetus, for instance, so that we can design safer cars. Let me skip that one because you already know that there are biological differences and there are uh, gender differences, one being, uh, so the sex is biological and the gender is uh, social. Um, it's very important that we realize, that researchers realize that men cannot be used as the norm for all genders. So it's not only about uh, male, female and women, it's also about the mice, as you saw, the cells, the DNA and so on, women being underrepresented in clinical trials because it's more expensive to have uh, um, two or more populations in your clinical trial. And the gender one is very important, I think, because it relates to urban transport, to health, to climate change. As an example, for instance, in several Swedish cities, they, on the basis of gender sensitive research, they were able to change the way they decided to change the way they were going to clear the snow in several cities. Okay, thinking about, hmm, we need to get the women to, usually the women, to get the children to school and then we will free up the bigger roads so that the men 
can get to work. But if you, if you free up the little paths first before the big paths, you make a change in the way we think about urban transport and in our minds about other things. So that's why this is important. As I said, a lack of awareness by uh, researchers, university leaders, policy makers, politicians, research funders and journal editors is really what we are, why we are engaged with this issue and the lack of systematic consideration in the research process. So the different... Uh, phases of the research process that need to be addressed. Uh, I'm going to skip that one, except to say that there's also a link to responsible research and innovation. That's a European EU speak again to say uh, things like research integrity, the role of universities in society, public engagement and so on matter. And we'd like to take this issue up in in our policy making as well. In terms of the research process, it's important that right at the outset, researchers consider in framing their research question, making sure that if you do this type of analysis, that your research is valid. Uh, this often uh, requires researchers to talk to others. Uh, people with expertise in other fields. So it can be a very interdisciplinary type of approach to framing your research question. We also say if there is no GRI dimension, that's fine too. But you should say you've looked at it and we didn't find the need to address it. So that for future researchers also, they know that you have done this. In the research evaluation process, they know that you have done this. In analyzing the results, of course, sex and gender, if it is valid, if it is applicable, gen sex and gender disaggregated outcomes should be looked at and reported. And of course, we have um, potentially the overlapping with other, with other uh, factors, so social, economic, environmental. So it could lead to a very complex analysis, but I think that's what we need to do. In addition, I'd also like to say that uh, when we were doing this paper, we sort of started looking at the gender balance in teams to see if that was related to whether it would lead to a better engagement with the issue of GRI. Uh, we didn't find much evidence on many studies on this. If somebody knows that this is being done, I'd like to find out. I'm going to skip the importance of um, SSH and give you a couple more examples. Although I would like to say just this, that um, the social sciences and humanities have a tradition uh, of incorporating sex and gender analysis into their research. And so that's an important area of expertise where other researchers can go to know how you do this. We shouldn't forget this. Um, and also it's important because of what I said earlier, the societal challenges that we face are not going to find solutions if we just look at it as a technological or an innovation uh, question. We do need to look at and we do need to involve the human questions, the social questions, right from the start. Yep. <laughs> the Gendered Innovation Project is the one from Stanford that I we talked about earlier, I put up this example because it shows how um, certain factors in the interact with gender. So in terms of uh, climate change, this reports on a study where they also looked at income, age, 
travel patterns, geographical location as intersecting with the climate change question. Um, this study is also interesting to read if you want to see how we cannot treat males, female, men, women as undifferentiated, undifferentiated groups. Often it's more complicated like that. You can't say for women it's like that, for men it's like that. It, it, they are not undifferentiated groups and we need to keep that in mind as well. Oh, that's not the uh, idea. Here is another example. So you know that the symptoms of a heart attack are different or may be different for men and women. I put this example here because you see that, uh, for instance, in the Netherlands, because of the research on heart failure and cardiovascular disease that they did there, it helped to set up national action. That's what I mean with the public engagement. So they have an initiative, a national initiative called Women Inc., which is an initiative for public dissemination. It's important to do the research, it's perhaps even more important to get the results of your research out there and make sure that it is, uh, helps to contribute to societal change. I, I put up this example because I just like it. Um, <laughs> because female birds sing too. <laughs> they used to do, you know, and I'm a linguist, so um, I look at all kind. I have looked at all kinds of communication systems. Animals communicate, birds communicate. But did you know that the research on birds used to be done mostly on male birds? So it's important to be able to look at the differences in communication because animal communication can also tell us things about human communication. This example, all of these are examples from our paper, is about, uh, the reason I put it up is why it's important to include the GRI dimension in education. Uh, it's not only about making sure that our researchers do the right thing, it's about making sure that the next generations of researchers do the right thing. And all graduates, researchers or non-researchers, that they know about these issues as informed citizens, as uh, future uh, policy makers, perhaps, and whatever roles they put into this. So in the sports education program of the University of Paris Sud, this issue is specifically addressed. Another example from Lund University, where they had a project called gender certification. Um, they had, for instance, workshops to understand gender assumptions in the physics professors teaching and research. And as part of that, somebody went to look at uh, textbooks and found that they were incredibly gendered. Um, uh, you know, why do you need to have a picture like that one to talk about a physical uh, phenomenon, which is about revolving mirrors? Um, so, uh, and they tried to, as a result, to de-gender textbooks. So we did the paper and we went also looking at what are our universities are doing about this. Um, as I said, there is an, a disconcerting uh, level of lack of awareness of this and it's quite hard to find uh, examples but I have to the good on the good side I have to say that working within a network uh, as Liru is it also brings about change uh, not long after we did the uh, paper more of our universities started having workshops seminars information sessions to inform researchers about what this is about and how they can address it in their research so I think that in itself is a really important um, uh, effect or consequence of it. So now for the recommendations. Um, there are about 20 recommendations in the paper. Uh, I'm not going to go through them in the interest of, of time, but because some of them, as the universities have already said, to create awareness, to, in, to allocate internal funds, to identify experts within the university, to make the link to teaching and so on. So for journals, uh, Cara mentioned it uh, also as well, it's very important that journals set standards for inclusion of GRI in their publications and develop clear guidelines for authors for governments to also be aware of this uh, issue, to include it in research priorities and in their policies, and to allocate funding for it. Uh, this is a non-funded or hardly funded specific uh, topic in many 
not all, there are exceptions, uh, but in, in many countries in Europe. To research funders, uh, the European Commission has been quite a uh, trailblazer in making this issue more known in Europe. So we think that re other research funders at the national level could follow suit and uh, take up the good example that the EC is setting. We need to desperately spread good practice on this. So as I said, the European Commission has made this an important issue. And um, uh, let me talk a little bit about the effects of, of how this is being taken up at the EU, at the EU level. Uh, the EU, the Commission, is both a policy-making, setting, influencing organ, and it's also a funding uh, organ. So in terms of the policy, the European research area is the main policy framework. And in the era roadmap, which the Commission, it's a paper, you know, sketching where we want Want to go with the European research area, they called for member states setting targets or setting uh, better integrating the issue into their policies and actions. Uh, this is not just words. Uh, the member states have to follow with na national action plans, which they did. And uh, so the Commission has now said they will follow up on this and may monitor this. In December 2015, the Council, so this is the uh, governmental, that is the national ministers or heads of states gathering. This was the Competitiveness Council, uh, so the research ministers said uh, reinforce this message. Uh, this is where also we get into the action because when in uh, earlier in the year we saw that GRI was not or hardly addressed in the council conclusions, in the draft council conclusions, we said, sorry, but you're forgetting something important here. And so through our work and through a press release, for instance, you know, we said we are definitely not there yet in terms of gender equality, but also make sure that you address the GRI. Uh, issue. Now, in uh, era pro the latest era progress report, if you look at it, there is still a low percentage of papers that include uh, GRI. This is actually in the first report that they also started monitoring GRI. So one, it's important that they're doing. Two, the results are not very good yet, but hopefully this will, the monitoring in itself, helps to raise awareness and pay for, for people to pay attention to this issue. Uh, they do note also there's a high number of planned measures, so in the national action plans. That means that change is coming and hopefully uh, countries and institutions will follow through on this. Uh, as I said, the low, the, in the um, signed grants um, in the Horizon 2020, they have looked and said it determined that about 36% of the signed grants took into account GRI. The way uh, they do that is when they launch the work programs and the calls for researchers, they flag, gender flag, certain topics. You know, and the flag means, oh, this is an issue where you potentially have to address uh, the sex and gender analysis. And then they look at the results to see to what extent that was taken, taken up. The Commission also has an advisory group on gender, which made a useful document with suggestions uh, for the work program of the European Commission. And there has also been a gender equality of Adam Acum, again with guidance for uh, applicants for research, and the Gender Innovations Report, which was by Londa Schiebinger and colleagues, which was funded by the EEC. So coming to my conclusions, I think the main takeaway from this talk is um, this is a very important issue, but there's still work to be done in terms of awareness raising and making it part of the thinking of researchers and institutions, funders and governments to make sure that we do this. Why? To improve the quality of the research and because we owe it to society to be gender sensitive. Uh, we work as Leary in advocacy and in exchanging good practice with other, uh, other organizations, uh, especially at the European level, and we plan to take that uh, into uh, account in our future policy making as well.
I would like to acknowledge uh, Professor Simone Boitendijk, who was one of the major authors of this paper, uh, Imperial College London, and also for making this quote, which she based on a saying by Mao Zedong, which the first part of it is, women hold up half the sky, and she added, certainly they deserve half the research as well. So true innovation and uh, robust responses to global problems will not come about if half of the population, more or less half of the population, is not served correctly by research. Thank you so much, Dr. Catherine Mays, for such a compelling presentation. I believe